Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Uh, welcome to the course on uh, biostatistics and design of experiments. We will continue on the topic of uh, non-parametric test. Yesterday I talked about non-parametric test and um, generally this uh, non-parametric test is used when uh, the data is ordinal uh, that means we do not have uh, a x axis like for example uh, changes in a parameter as a function of time or and so on actually. Uh, so it is more of ordinal, it is numbers. The next one is if the distribution does not follow a say a normal distribution okay, or a chi-square distribution or a f distribution or a t distribution. Okay. Um, if the variances are unequal, okay, so all these conditions we cannot use the, uh, the parametric test. We have spent lot of time on these parametric tests like your f test, t test, uh, chi-square test. Uh, z test and so on. So, we cannot use any one of these and uh, we need to resort to non-parametric uh, test. So, what are those non-parametric tests? Um, we have these on um, equivalent to a two sample t test if you are comparing two independent uh, samples there is something called man Whitney Wilcoxon rank sum test. Then if you are doing a pair t test that means you are using the same subjects for uh, say control and test it is comparing dependent variables, there is something called sign test or Wilcoxon sign rank test. If you are doing a one way ANOVA equivalent uh, that is you are comparing independent samples, then there is something called Kruskal values test. Okay. So, yesterday in the previous class we looked at uh, these two uh, rank sum test, sign test and sign rank test and so on. Now, let us look at um, equivalent to your one way ANOVA. What do we do in one way ANOVA? We have several sets of uh, samples and we are trying to compare them. Uh, if uh, you have the homogeneity of variance, we can use ANOVA, but uh, otherwise then we need to resort to something called a Kruskal values test. So, if you want to compare three or more populations, um, if you have two or more po two population then of course, we can use this man Whitney Wilcoxon rank sum test or if it is a paired then we can use the sign test and so on. But if we are having three or more populations, then we go resort to something called Kruskal values test. So, because one way ANOVA generally assumes a normality or equivalent equality of variance or homogeneity of variance. Um, so, in a non-parametric situation we use this particular test. Um, so, what does it do? So, it looks at all the observations and then ranks them okay. and then once it ranks them we will sum up each of the group ranks. Okay. So, you understand, so we will sum up each of the group ranks and we will get say some summation r1, r2, r3. Okay. So, if some of these r's are larger than others then it indicates the response values in different groups come from different populations. Okay. So, that is what it is. So, what we do is uh, we put all the data together, we rank them in an ascending order and then uh, for each group we sum up all the ranks um, and then we compare these ranks using some statistic. Okay. Let us look at a problem. So, the uh, before that this is the test statistic. So, 12 divided by n into n plus 1 where n is the total sample size. So, if you have uh, say many groups each one having n 1, n 2, n k sample size we add up all that gives you n. And then here we have a summation i is equal to 1 to k n i that is the number of uh, uh, samples in that uh, i th the data set okay. r i by n i is the average rank for group i minus n plus 1 divided by 2. Okay. This is the test statistics. So, what we do under the um, null hypothesis this is an approximate chi square distribution with degrees of freedom equal to um, k minus 1 that is the approximation is ok when each group contains at least 5 observations. Okay. So, uh, we compare this to statistics okay, using the chi square distribution. Okay, Let us look at an example, this example was taken up from uh, this particular paper 
okay. It is called clinical therapeutics. So, a clinical trial evaluating the fever reducing effect of three drugs are tested aspirin, ibuprofen, as, as, acetaminophen. Okay. Um, so, it was given to adults and um, they were tested when they had a body temperature of 100 to 100.9. Okay. The subjects were randomly given uh, either aspirin or ibuprofen or acetaminophen and after 2 hours their body temperature was again recorded okay. and then it is listed. So, 3 drugs, so it is very random set of data. So, the temperature uh, decrease is shown here. Of course, in this particular case there is a te temperature increase. So, aspirin we had 4 uh, candidates, um, they had a temperature decrease of these numbers, ibuprofen there are 5 candidates who had a temperature decrease of these and acetaminophen we had a, um, 6 candidates, 5 of them temperature decreased, one case temperature also increased. Now, we add up all these and then rank them, we start uh, the smallest with rank 1 and then uh, go upwards. Okay. So, when you do that, so this is the 1 because this is the smallest number, okay, then comes 2, then 3, 4, 5 like that you go again, go on. Uh, finally, we end up with 15. Okay. Now, what do we do? We add up all these ranks together, these ranks together, these ranks together. Um, so, the total data set is uh, 15, 4 um, plus 5, 9 plus 6, 15. So, capital N is 15. Um, if you look at Ris, that means uh, the summation, if you add up all these, okay, you get 44, total number of data points is 4. If you add up all these, you get 50. Uh, total number of data points is 5, you add up all these 6, uh, total is 26. So, obviously, there seems to be some large difference. So, you may expect it to be um, behaving differently. Now, we go to this test statistic, okay. H is equal to, you remember this test statistics which I introduced. So, 12 divided by 15 plus 16, um, 3 terms are coming 4, 5, 6 because we have four set, uh, 3 sets of data 4. 5, 6 here, okay. uh, 4, 5, 6 and then uh, 44 is the sum for data set 1, 50 is the sum for data set 2, 26 is the sum of data set 3. So, 4, 5, 6 is the terms that is coming in denominator. So, we do this addition, we end up with 6.833. Okay. So, you look at the chi-square test for 6.833, so the area comes out to be 0 0.03. So, obviously, it is significant. So, you reject the null hypothesis or you look at the um, chi-square table um, for this is a 3 data sets are there, okay, acetaminophen, um, ibuprofen and aspirin. So, the degrees of freedom is 2. So, we can look into this, uh, you remember this table, we look into the 2 for a 95 percent one sided, we get 5.99 and the H, um, the statistic comes to be 6.833. So, we reject the null hypothesis at uh, 95 percent uh, uh, confidence for one tail. Okay. This is how you do this. So, what we do is uh, we combine all the data, we um, rank them and then uh, add up each one of the set of ranks uh, separately and then we use this formula. This is the statistic 12 divided by the total number of data points capital N, this is the um, tot sum of the ranks for each i, okay, sum of the rank for each i divided by n i that is the total number of uh, points in that uh, 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 set minus n is the total plus 1 divided by 2 and then you compare it with the chi square table. Okay, now, the next question is uh, which drug is statistically significantly different from the other. Now, again there is a different type of approach, okay, again there is a different types. So, the conclusion using the Kruskal Valley's test, we have evidence to suggest that the temperature changes after taking different drugs are not the same. Because P comes out to be 0 0.033 area, we can get it using Excel. Um, so, Excel has this command called chi, chi dist. So, we can put this chi dist, I had explained this command. So, chi dist we get 6.833, 6.833, 2 degrees of freedom. Okay. It gives you 0 0.03287, that is the probability or that is the area under this curve. Okay. So, we can uh, use 
either uh, the command chi dist from Excel and get the uh, probability value or we can use this table okay, or we can use this table for 0 0.05 one sided 2 degrees of freedom 5.99 and you can say this um, st statistics calculated is larger than 5.99. Okay. So, we reject the null hypothesis. Is there a statistically significant difference between these three drugs? How do you go about doing that? Um, there is another test, okay. which drugs significantly differ from another? There is something called multiple comparisons for Kruskal values test. Okay. So, from the Kruskal values test, we concluded okay, um, there is a statistically significant uh, difference between these three drugs. Okay. Uh, now, how do you find out uh, which drug is statistically different? So, to determine that there is another formula like this, if group I is significantly different from group J. That means, if you take one drug say aspirin and then you call this ibuprofen. So, you put in the aspirin data, put in the ibuprofen data, okay, this is the number, this is the total and then this is the total 15 is this number and then compute p value and compare to alpha divided by 2 m where m is the number of possible pairwise comparison that is m is given by k uh, multiplied by k minus 1 by 2. So, you need to compare this results okay, with the, this particular uh, m value and see whether this result um, is uh, less than this. Value, okay. So, what is k? Let us look into this problem. So, the statistics, so let us compare aspirin and acetaminophen. Uh, so, R i minus R j, uh, here you have N i, you have N j, then N here N i N j. Uh, as you know for, um, okay, uh, for aspirin N i is 4, for acetaminophen um, N j is 6 okay, and then um, the total N is 15. So, we substitute all these into this. Okay. Okay, we get the z that is once you calculate the z, uh, the probability uh, of 0 0.0104 is obtained from your z table. Okay, and then, okay, then uh, we compare it. Then we look at it 0. Okay, then we look at 0 0.05 divided by 2.3. That is k. Um, that is alpha is 0 0.05. Uh, divided by 2 m, where uh, 2 m is given by k into k minus 1 divided by 2, okay. k is k so you get uh, this as 0 0.00833, okay, 0 0.00833, okay. And um, this is much less than uh, this particular uh, probability value, okay. So, obviously, um, the p value is not less than the 0 0.00833 value. So, we re fail to reject the H naught that is uh, the H naught in this particular case is aspirin and acetaminophen um, behave in the same way. There is no reason for you to reject the null hypothesis. So, similarly we can take uh, aspirin and ibuprofen and do this similar study. Okay, then we can take uh, ibuprofen and acetaminophen and do the similar study and so on actually. Okay, so, it is very straightforward to do that. Do you understand how to do this problem? Uh, so, basically what you do is, okay, um, what you do is first step is to uh, look at this equation, substitute all the data and then uh, get your statistic, compare it with the table statistic and then you make, uh, you conclude uh, in this particular case the drugs differ differently. Once you do that, you go into multiple comparisons for Kruskal values test, which makes use of this. Okay. In that multiple comparison, you calculate something called uh, the z i j that is comparing two cases i and j okay. um, and then you calculate the probability from this and after that, uh, you there is something called bon Ferroni corrected signal level where alpha if you take it as uh, 0 0.05 uh, 2 m m is given by k into k minus 1 by 2 
where K, we here we have three drugs, so K becomes three, K minus one becomes two. So if you put them together, what do you get? Um, the bond Ferioni corrected significance level is 0 0.00833 and um, uh, the statistic you get 0 0.01044. 0 so obviously this is much larger than this, there is no reason for you to reject the null hypothesis. Okay? Do you understand how this is done? Um, so this is useful uh, for comparing uh, more than uh, two sets of uh, uh, data, whereas uh, we used to use ANOVA, uh, whereas in this particular uh, situation when the data is ordinal or non-normal then we can use uh, this type of cross uh, valleys comparison, okay? cross valleys test. Okay, now uh, we looked at large number of uh, approaches for uh, non-parametric test, okay. we looked at large number of approaches for non-parametric equivalent to your two sample and parity test and one way ANOVA, we have all these rank based test. Okay. As you can see many of them makes use of the rank, if you have a large data set we rank them from in an ascending order and see how the ranks are. Okay. So that is how this type of non-parametric tests are conducted and then you have in some cases like Wilcoxon rank test we have tables, you compare it with the tables whereas Kruskal values you compare it with the chi-square. Okay. Okay, now um, there is another situation where you, you are talking where you are having non-normal type of distribution. Okay. Uh, in any normal we, uh, if you are comparing two sets of data or multiple sets of data, we consider some thing called the homogeneity of variance. Okay. So if that uh, we need to check whether your data set has homogeneity of variance, that is very important. If they do not satisfy the homogeneity of variance, then we need to use some other type of test. Okay. So for example, ANOVA requires the variances of different populations are equal. Uh, this can be determined by the following approach. How do you do that? We can compare graphically. There is something called box plot I will show you or we can compare variance, standard deviation, we can even do this statistical test like F test, right. Suppose we have two sets of samples, we look at the variance of set 1, the variance of set 2, divide one by another that is called F test and if we have many then we perform something called ANOVA, okay. But then uh, there are other tests for checking the homogeneity of variances like Levin's test. Fling, Fligner, Achillean test, Bartley's test. So all these tests are available. Um, we will, let us look at one or two. Will let us not spend too much time on remaining tests because um, we can easily find out about the homogeneity of variance by using even these approaches also. Okay. What's a box, box plot? It's also called a box and whis, uh, whisker plot. Okay. This is a graphical depicting groups of numerical data through their uh, quartiles. So, um, generally data is represented like this, so this is called the um, quartile 1, this is called the quartile 3 and this is the median or it is also called the second quartile, okay. this is the maximum up to what the data goes up to, this is the minimum up to what the data goes up to. Sometimes if you have outliers which you do not consider in your quartile calculation, you put them as stars. Okay, so this plot is very good because it tells you um, how the data is spread, the quartile 1, quartile 3, median and what is the minimum value, what is the maximum value, so it gives you nice picture. And if there are any outliers also we can mark it. So if I have 2, 3 data sets we can draw this box, uh, box and whisker plot and see how these uh, rectangles are. Are the rectangles very big or the rectangles are very small? Uh, these are called whiskers. So, how the whiskers are spread and so on. That is called a box and whisker plot. Okay. So, for example, uh, if this is your data and um, your, um, your box and whisker looks like this, obviously it is skewed to the right. Symmetric means it will be nice centered, uh, it will be in the middle of the box. Okay. Um, both sides equal like this, like this. Whereas uh, if it is squeed right, squeed right, skewed right, you will have it like this. If it is skewed left, you will have it like this. Okay. So by looking at it, we can always say normality of the data. So it's very good uh, um, 
visual observation. This is called box and whisker plot. This particular pictures are taken from these reference actually. Okay. So, as you can see when if it is skewed left you will have lot of data uh, as you can see the whisker very long here the whisker is very short. If it is skewed right you will have very long whisker on the right hand side a very short whisker on the left hand side. So, if it is a symmetric you will try uh, you will see both equal on both sides. Okay. So, it is a quick reference uh, and this is called the box and whisker plot. Okay. Then you have the Levens test. So, what you do is you have a set of data uh, you calculate the residuals from the group means. So, if you have the group mean then uh, you subtract each one of the cell you get the residual. So, once you get the residual you perform an ANOVA on those residuals. Of course, you take the absolute value of the residuals. If the group variances are equal then the average size of the residual should be the same across all groups. Do you understand? It is very simple. So, what you do is uh, we take the mean and then uh, we take the difference uh, take the absolute value. So, th those are the uh, that is called the residuals absolute value and then you perform an ANOVA. So, we can perform it for uh, 2 data sets or 3 data sets ANOVA and then uh, we can uh, um, show the H naught uh, whether H it satisfies the H naught or not satisfies the H naught. So, it is very simple that is called the Levin test. Then we have the uh, Fligner Killeen test. What is what is this? This is also a non parametric test for homogeneity of group variances based on ranks. Now, you have heard quite a lot about ranks, right? It is useful when the data is non normal or when there are outliers. So, what you do is we calculate the absolute values of the residuals from the group medians and then all these residuals are ranked. So, you may first calculate the absolute values okay, then put them together and then um, calculate the ranks of each one of them okay. and then you calculate the statistics called Fligder Killeen where this is summation of j is equal to 1 to k n j okay, the size of the group j. Uh, a j bar minus a bar square by s square. A j bar is the mean of the normalization value for the jth group and a bar is the mean of all the normalization values and s is the vari s square is the variance and k is the number of groups n is the size of the group. Okay. We can do this okay. and after that uh, we can check it using a chi square uh, distribution. Uh, one tail probability of the chi square distribution to see whether they follow the chi square distribution okay as simple as this you understand so uh, you have the levens test which is looking at the residuals uh, uh, from the average values and then perform an anova or we have the fligner killin test where we are looking at uh, the fk which is the statistic this is based on the absolute values of the residuals okay. and then uh, you perform a chi square distribution um, test to see whether the H naught is uh, um, agreed or it is rejected. Okay. Then you have another test that is called the Bartlett's test for homogeneity of variance. Okay. So, you have here again a Bartlett's stat test statistics it looks quite big and this also makes use of the chi square distribution. So, the equation looks big where uh, you are uh, n is the sample size of the ith group k is the number of groups n is the sample size of the ith group k is the number of group s um, s is given like this okay um, s square is the variance total variance and the si square is the variance of the ith group uh, as you can see here okay the c here is given like in this formula. So, what you do is you calculate this test statistics um, substituting the c here substituting the s here and then you use the um, chi square distribution. So, what is the null hypothesis that the all group variances are equal it is rejected if p value is less than alpha okay. and uh, your chi square distribution will b will come here k is the number of groups. So, obviously, k minus 1 is your degrees of freedom. Okay. So, here the Bartlett's test we have a statistics and then we apply chi square distribution. In the Fligner Killeen test we have a statistics which makes use of residuals then again we apply chi square distribution. In the Levinis test uh, we calculate the residuals 
um, with respect to the average from each group and then uh, the data set containing residuals we apply the uh, one way ANOVA. So, all these different types of tests help you to uh, determine the homogeneity of variance and uh, uh, it tells you whether uh, the variances are equal or they are largely different. And of course, you have also have the uh, box uh, whisker plot which pictorially depicts uh, um, how the variances are of each set of uh, groups of samples. Okay? So, we have been looking at uh, non-parametric uh, distribution where uh, the data set could be non-normal, data set could be ordinal, uh, the data set uh, could have large uh, differences in the variances. Okay? In such situations, what type of tests we can use? Equivalent to your t test, two sample t test, pair t test, ANOVA, we have the different types of sign test, rank test um, and so on actually. Okay? So, that sort of will complete uh, uh, the various types of tests okay? um, and uh, let us look at uh, some other dis some more distributions. We looked at uh, Z distribution, then we looked at uh, T distribution, okay? then uh, we looked at uh, chi square distribution, F distribution. Let us look at uh, one more distribution that is called the beta distribution. Okay? This is also very useful distribution to um, talk about. Okay? Beta distribution. Um, is a random variable x is said to have a beta distribution with parameter, it has got 4 parameters alpha, beta, a and b. If the probability density function follows this type of relation. Okay? So, it has got 4 parameters alpha, beta, a and b uh, okay? and x, x here, x will be um, lying between a and b and alpha and beta are always greater than 0, you understand. So, this is how the relationship will look like. Um, and alpha and beta are greater than 0, these are called gamma functions. Uh, I talked about long time back. So, gamma alpha is alpha minus 1 factorial, gamma beta will be beta minus 1 factorial, gamma alpha plus beta will be alpha plus beta minus 1 factorial. Okay? Um, so, you have 4 parameters here minimum that is the minimum value, uh, it can be anything, maximum that is the maximum value, anything alpha is greater than 0, beta is greater than 0, both are called the shape factors. So, you can have a special case, this is called standard beta distribution when alpha a is equal to 0 and b is equal to 1. So, if you substitute that in that in the previous equation, in this equation uh, a is equal to 0 and b is equal to 1. Okay, what do you have? You have something like this, quite simple looking equations okay, for x lying between 0 to 1. So, if it is 0 to 1, it will have a distribution, if it is not between these, it will be always 0 otherwise. So, for different values of alpha and beta, we can have different types of shapes. Okay, as you can see, your beta distribution okay, with the alpha of 0.5 and beta of 0.5. Um, beta, uh, beta distribution um, that is probably density function alpha of 0.5 and beta of 2. So, if you have both 2, 2 you get like this. So, if you have 2 and 0.5 you have get like this. So, you can see that we can get a large number of uh, shapes with these alpha and beta. So, this is very, very useful uh, especially for uh, um, simulations and modeling. So, we can generate any type of function as you can see you can get maxima going down, you can get exponentially sort of falling down, you can have exponentially rising, you can have uh, a linear rising. Okay? Yeah, uh, so, and then you can get bathtub type of curves. So, you can get any type of curve by manipulating your alpha and manipulating your beta. So, it is very useful for simulation purposes. So, if, if you want to generate any um, shape, uh, we take this beta distribution function, uh, put A and B as 0 and 1 respectively and we can use whatever alpha and beta we want to use uh, to achieve the shape. Okay. Uh, Let us go forward. So, it can take a wide variety of shapes, it can look like triangular, uniform, exponential, normal, log normal, gamma. So, it is fantastic actually. 
used exten extensively in project planning, controls, okay, uh, growth curves in your uh, bacterial systems like as you can see, you can see we can get different types of uh, growth curves, okay, different types of growth patterns, you know, using uh, modifying your alpha and beta. So, the mean of this will be like this A plus B minus A alpha by alpha plus B. So, if uh, A is 0, B is 1, what happens? You will get alpha divided by alpha plus B, your standard deviation is given like this. So, if B is 1, this will go away. So, your uh, standard deviation will be square root of alpha B divided by alpha plus B square root of alpha plus beta plus 1. Okay. So, there is something called cumulative distribution function. So, you just need to integrate between 0 to x okay, uh, of the beta distribution okay, and it is given like this, b is your beta function. Okay. Beta function is nothing but this, this is your beta function, sorry, this is your beta function. So, you can integrate that uh, to get your cumulative distribution function. So, for example, uh, if your probability did, uh, looks like this, sorry, probability density function looks like this, your cumulative will look like this. If your probability density function will look like this, cumulative will keep on increasing. Uh, cumulative generally will keep on increasing. So, if your probability density function looks like this, uh, for 2 and 2, your cumulative will go like this. If your probability density function looks like this, your cumulative will go like that. Okay? Uh, so, this equation is also useful because it gives you an idea about the cumulative density function. Okay. So, let us look at an example, uh, time necessary to complete any particular activity once it has been started follows a beta distribution. Suppose A is the optimistic time is given in 2 days, B is the pessimistic time given 5, alpha is equal to 2, beta is equal to 3, then uh, the mean will be 3.2. That means, on an average it will take you 3.2 days to complete the task. Of, now, for these values of alpha and beta, the probability density function of x is a simple polynomial because if you substitute the cumulated distribution function like this, okay. So, we put uh, your alpha is um, your alpha is 2, beta is 3, okay, alpha is 2, beta is 3 and then a as uh, 2, b as 5. So, you substitute this into the equation uh, and you integrate them, you end up with a probability of 0.407. So, the probability of uh, completing the task uh, at most 3 days, that means maximum of 3 days is given as a probability of 0.47. Okay. And you also in your um, excel we have this beta dist okay, which gives you x alpha beta a b. Okay. Um, so, let me look at it excel. Um, so, we have the excel function which is given by beta dist equal to beta dist and you want to calculate at um, say it is, it is given as x alpha beta a b. So, in your case alpha and beta is 2 and 3 respectively, a and b is 2 and 5 respectively. So, if you want to finish it in uh, 3 days. Okay, uh, what happens? Two comma five. Sorry, uh, if you want to finish it in three days, as here at most three days, uh, what should it be there? So we need to put uh, the values. Sorry, three comma two comma three because uh, um, alpha is two beta is uh, 3, then A is 2, that is the optimistic time, um, then the pessimistic time is 3, 5. So, you get 0 0.407. So, the probability of finishing it in 3 at most in 3 days is 0 0.407. Uh, that is same as what uh, is got by integrating this uh, uh, cumulative distribution function. So, we can use the um, Excel to do the same thing and Excel uh, uh, has this beta dist command. Uh, you want to know the probability at any value of x uh, and you know the alpha, you know the beta, you know this a and you know the b. So, it gives you at 0 0.407. Okay. So, we will continue on this uh, distribution in the next class also. Thank you very much for your time.